It's Jules and Jim. Hey, Jim. I'm Jim. This is Jules. Am I pointing the right? I think in the end, this would be, uh, I, th- I think you'd be this way. I feel like I'm when a- we record, I think it records like a mirror image. So I think I would say, this is Jules. Should I say, and this is Jim? You don't have to. Would you be, I would be, would I be on your left or right? I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to figure that out for next episode. (laughs) But for those that don't know, you are the brainchild of this show. Is that right? I forget what year it was. You said we should do a show and we're going to call it Jules and Jim. You didn't even ask. You just said we're, we're calling it. Jules and Jim. Well, that's naturally what you'd call it because I'm Jules and you're Jim. And of course, it's a reference to Fellini. Did you not know that? No. Oh, okay. So wait, wait, break down Fellini. Okay. And I'll tell you what I discovered over the last couple of weeks. Okay. So Fellini is one of the godfathers of French New Wave cinema. And he does a very famous film called Jules and Jim. And so when we found each other, and I realized that we were like a match made in, on, in audio heaven. I said, oh, we'll do a podcast. We'll name it Jules and Jim, obviously. I never knew of that film until I loaded our show on YouTube. And I thought, oh, Jules and Jim, such an original name. And I yeah. typed it in the search bar and all these black and white clips came up. And I oh. thought, what? Like Jules and Jim is a, it's a it's a famous French film. Jules and Jim is like the, you know how you say things like, it's like die hard on a bus. It's like die hard in a, you know, in like a nursery school classroom. That's what you would use. That's the film you would use in French New Wave cinema. You would say, oh, it's like Jules and Jim at the seaside. It's like Jules and Jim in, you know, Saint Tropez. This is like Jules and Jim on the internet. That's what we're do, doing. Do people think that we're biting? Like, oh, like how, how dare they call themselves Jules and Jim? I mean, listen, first of all, we didn't call we didn't call ourselves Jules and Jim. Our parents named us Jules and Jim. That's true. That's number one. And number two, like, what about this speaks? What about this screams French New Wave besides the name? Wait, hold on. (laughs) Let me look this up a little more. Okay. Do you like how we. We research on the fly. Yeah. So wait, it says Jules and Jim. Set before and after World War I, it describes a tragic love triangle involving French bohemian Jim, right, that, guy that Austrian guy friend <laughs> Jules, and Jules's girlfriend and later wife Catherine. And this movie came out in 1962. Now it says it was directed by Francois Truffaut. Oh, it's a Truffaut film. That's right. Truffaut, not- Truffaut. Truffaut. Fellini is Italian, New Wave. Truffaut. Okay, Truffaut. 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 Yes, Truffaut. Truffaut. All right. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, the reason I bring all of this up is because I want to do a black and white episode. I've been inspired by Joel's and Jim. Oh, my God. Is this going to turn black and white? So shall we turn it black and white? Oh, my God. Yes. Did I wear the yes. right thing? That's why I, I wore this today because... It feels like you would wear something like this in a French film. I, I feel like I'm dressed in like a French film, but like right? make, but make it hip hop. <laughs> so <laughs> today on Jules and Jim, inspired yeah. by the classic French film Jules and Jim, yes. we will be talking about our favorite black and white things. I love it. Yes. Now that we're in black and white for this episode. I like this. How does my hair look in black and white? Like what type of a shade is this? I think it looks good. I don't know. We'll see. No, it looks good. Now, now do people think we're actually biting Jules and Jim? It's black and white. No, that's not the, that's not the French film. They're like, is that Truffaut or is that just a Jim Shearer production? But maybe, okay. maybe we'll get caught up in the Jules and Jim algorithm and then more people will watch this. I feel like your hat is looking a little French New Wave. like the I, know, I know I wore it on purpose. Oh, it's like a cap. Yeah. I feel, do, I have, do I have anything French that I could like, you know, that I could, that I could be using right now? I feel like I don't have any like French things. Do you want to go first or you want me to go first? All right, you go first. All right. So I think you'll have a lot to say about this. Okay. Black and white album covers. Ooh, I love a black and white album cover. What comes to mind is Steal This Album. Was that not in black and white? It has to, every great artist I feel has made a black and white album. And I even get to say my favorite rhyme. Everyone from 
Nirvana to Madonna to Rihanna to Ariana, they have had black and white album covers. Yeah, totally. All right. So also, Rage Against the Machine. Hmm? The Beatles have done it. Yeah. Janet Jackson has done it. But my favorite, the Beastie Boys. Obviously, check your head. And they did it for four straight releases. They did it with Check Your Head into Some Old Bullshit, okay. into Ill Communication, into Alio Eolio. Did you know for the Check Your Head album cover, which is in glorious black and white, Glennie Friedman only took three shots of the Beastie Boys sitting on the sidewalk. His favorite is the one where Yauk has his hands cupped near his head. Yeah. The one that was used is Yauk covering his mouth. And then there's one where Yauk breaks character and is smiling. So if you were Adam Yauk and you received these three photographs, which one would you use for Check Your Head? Are you asking me to put myself in Adam Yauk's shoes? Yes, I just did. How could I ever? I can't. I couldn't do it. It's. I couldn't do it when he was alive. I can't do it now. But do you have a favorite out of these three? I do. I, it, it's heartbreaking to even look at these. It's like it hurts. It hurts to even look. But I like the one where I like the one where Yauk is breaking character because it's it's so sweet and so cute and how he's looking right at the camera. But you can't use that for an album cover, especially in the early 90s. But for the album cover. Okay, okay. Sorry I'm I yelling like, at you, by the way. I know. I'm like, give me a minute. I like the bottom right where Yauk is like this. Is that the album cover? Is that what no. they use? They used, they the used that for a sticker and a t-shirt, and that's actually Glennie Friedman's favorite one. I like that one because I think it looks the coolest, but I I, pref I think the one that they chose is better because there's more Beastie Boys in the frame. Because, like... <clears throat> Adam Harvitz is like leaning in, whereas in the bottom one, he's leaning out. You can't really see him so much. Really? I think, I feel like he's leaning out in both of those. Are you, no, he's kind of leaning back. He's leaning back. He's doing I the Fat Joe. <laughs> he's leaning back. I think that's, um, Fat Joe isn't leaned back, isn't it? Uh, uh, Terror Squad. Is that Fat Joe? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fat Joe's on that. Is he? I mean, it is Terror back? Squad, but Fat Joe's part of that. Okay. I do like how in the one that we're talking about at the bottom right, how, um, uh, Mike D's like paper bag is very in focus. Like what's in that bag? It looks like he just like took off his jacket. was like, let me just stick this jacket in this bag real quick. Okay, I'm ready for the picture. You know what Glenn told me? What? He wanted, because they were returning to instruments, he wanted to capture the vibe of them going to band practice again. Mm -hmm. So Yauk has his bass, Ad-Rock has the guitar, and Mike right. D has drumsticks in that bag to symbolize the drums. Was that his, was that where he carried his drumsticks? Like he carried them in a paper bag? Well, that symbolizes the drums because it would look weird if he was sitting on top of a whole drum kit. Or even like, what about like a drum bag though? Like, like Randy has a bag that he puts drumsticks in. I feel like, I don't know, like a drum bag would feel kind of, I, I like the, the brown grocery bag. I like it too. And I get, I get, I understand that makes a lot of sense because the way he's sitting with the bag kind of in between his knees is almost like a snare. It's really cool. Ooh, okay. Now, did you know, so ill communication, okay? Ah, there we go. Okay. So that's a, a Bruce Davidson photo and the Beastie Boys, I think Ad-Rock was looking through a photo book and he decided that this would be cool for the Beastie Boys next album cover. So they show it to Glennie Friedman and Glennie Friedman, who's a very opinionated individual, said, no, that's not the album cover. Let me shoot the album cover. And they said, well, like, it's, we got to hurry up because the album's coming out. Glennie Friedman got a friend. They went down to the New York City subway and they took this picture and then he showed it to Yauk. And according to Glennie Friedman, they almost got the Beastie Boys to bite. But then one of the Beastie Boys asked, well, who is the guy in that picture? And the guy in that picture is Brett Ratner, who later became a famous director. But apparently he was in the scene back then. And the Beastie Boys are like, eh, we, we don't want Brett Ratner to be on, be on our <laughs> album cover. So Glennie Friedman did not get this album cover. Wow. But do you, do you like, could you imagine that being the album cover for Ill Communication? I, I could imagine it as far as a composition, but I, 
it's very Beastie Boys to be like Brett Ratner. Like, mm, I'm not feeling it so much. And now <laughs> I think he's, I think he's now like a problematic person. I think he's had right. some allegations and things. So I, I think it's prophetic. And also, like, it's very Beastie Boys to like not want to have another famous person in anything. Well, he wasn't famous at the time. No, what's but that? Unless it's someone they're actually friends with. Right, because like, they weren't right. friends with him. He wasn't famous at the time. And I think they knew of him. And they're like, eh. And I think yeah. that was the straw that broke the camel's back. So that's why that was not the cover for Ill Communication. All right, one last thing. I always loved the album cover for Dig Your Own Hole from the Chemical Brothers. I like it, too. I think it's really cool. You know, we, we made, when I was young, um, in like art, I'm just remembering this, we learned how to do printmaking in like the very old fashioned style where you would use these, you would take this like black um, square, it must have been made of some kind of resin or something. And you would take a like a scraping tool and you would scrape out where you'd want the negative space to be and rub ink on the square and then press it. And that's exactly what this looks like to me. It looks like a like a real old school print made yes. that way, like hair, you know what I mean? It's really cool. Very beautiful. It's just straight. This one's straight up black and white no grays yeah oh is that right yeah i i love the the clean design of this i love black and white always always all right so i've talked about album covers too much now now it's your turn what do you like in the black and white world um i mean the dalmatian yes yeah the Dal the dalmatian beautiful coat <laughs> mean dog not that friendly which which i like Feels a little like okay. me. Okay. And I would go so far as to say inspired the best remake of a children's movie that I've seen since being a parent. And that film and accompanying soundtrack is called Cruella, starring Emma Stone and Emma Thompson. And the soundtrack to Cruella has my daughter requesting things like the Stooges in my car. Ah. You know what I mean? Like it's really a really an entry point to 70s English rock music for kids in a way that no and and not covers originals in a way that no other film has been. At least that's been my experience. Let me tell you what's on the soundtrack to Cruella. Are you ready? Yes. Are you ready, Jim? Yes, I'm Are ready. Sure? OK, this is what's on the Cruella soundtrack. I'm just going to read it to you. Five to one by the doors. Come Together, the Ike and Tina Turner version. I Want to Be Your Dog, John McRae. Stone Cold Crazy by Queen. Should I Stay or Should I Go? The Clash. One Way or Another, Blondie. Bloody Well Right by Supertramp. Feeling Good, Nina Simone. Whisper, Whisper by the Bee Gees and, and, and more. It's, um, it's an amazing, amazing movie. The costuming in this movie is phenomenal, but the music is so good. And like my kid has seen over the years, you know, the Smurfs movies, the one, um, the one where they all put on the play, like all the movies with uh, with the these popular soundtracks, and and they learn these like kind of cover songs or remakes or like gentle versions of of good music, which is great. I love that. But what I like about Cruella is that they don't cover the songs. That's they're, great. It's great. There's no reason why you need to like remake. No, that's song. why. I don't allow kids bop in my household. Yeah. Do you allow kids bop in your household? Are you kidding me? How could you? Yeah. What kind, of, what kind of what kind of person would I be if I have to like dumb down? In the words of Jay Z, <laughs> lyrically, <laughs> like what does he say? Lyrically, I would be Talib Kweli, and then he says, "But I had to dumb it down for the critics, and they all yelled holla." You remember that in the Black Album, there's like a song where he talks about that. And I feel that that's what happens with the music on Kids Bop is like, we have really good records. Why are we dumbing it down for children? Like children are the most open, non-judgmental, creative people that exist in the world. Why would we take the organic elements out of something or soften the edges when they're not the ones even making like any type of inference? I'm glad, you know, if you said, Oh yeah, like I swear by Kids Bop. We might have to end this series. I don't really like understand Kids Bop. <laughs> really. I know it's so successful. I, I understand playing the clean versions of songs and I would choose to play a clean version right. of a song or just not play a song for Correct. My kid. Yes. But how does like softening all the edges 
and like taking all of the emotional connection of the lead singer off of something, make it a children's version. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just, I'm so anti kids bop that I don't even, maybe I don't even think about it as deeply as you do. I'm just like, oh hell, oh, hell no. Like we're not listening to that. We'll listen to the real one. When did you become anti kids bop? Like how did you know you were anti kids bop? I used to, well, when I was working at MTV, we worked across the street from a Toys R Us. Okay. And I would always have to get presents for people. And they would always play Kids Bop. And I just hated it. I thought, why, why don't you just play the regular version? The regular version is so much better than the Kids Bop version. And then I thought it was weird having the kids dumb down the sexualized pop songs. To me, that made me feel icky. Yeah, agreed. All right. We, we should have uh, an episode about Kids Bop at some point. We literally just did. <laughs> All right, so I got to see Cruella. You, you got to see it. We're down with black and white album covers. Yeah. We're down with Dalmatians. Yes. My turn, one of my favorite black and white things, The Twilight Zone. You a fan? It is in black and white. I was like, I didn't get it. Am I a fan? I don't know that I'm a fan. I've seen some of the old episodes. Because some of those old ones still hold up today. I remember the one with the pig noses. Pig nose. Yeah. William Shatner on the airplane. What happens? I didn't see it. He had just come out of the psychiatric hospital and he's sitting on the window seat and there's a monster pulling up the metal from the wing. Uh -huh. And every time he gets someone, they look out and there's no one there and they think he's crazy. And then at the end of the episode, we realized that he wasn't crazy. There was actually a monster pulling on the wing of the airplane. It's so interesting how um, like gaslighting, which is such a popular word now, but as a concept, a horror concept, like has been with us from the, the first day till today, isn't it? Because it's one of the scariest things that your perception is like. Yes. Like, and then there's a lot of Twilight Zone episodes about people disregarding the truth, which really? when you watch today, you're like, holy crap, this feels like it was made yesterday. But like every one of the super states that preceded it, it has one iron rule. Logic is an enemy and truth is a menace. I think I would like to get into that. Where can I watch this? I forget where I, I don't know if it's like a Hulu thing now. I think it was on Netflix for a bit. And then back in the day, I would just tape them all on VHS. So good. So yeah, Twilight Zone, great black and white content there. Uh, what, what do you have next? Things that we love about black and white, since this is our black and white episode. The black and white cookie, which is just like the most basic bitch thing. <laughs> can, I, can I add on to that? Yeah. I, I, I know that Technically, it's not black and white. Neither is the black and white cookie. It's like white and brown. But I loved when I moved to New York that they made a delineation with the black and white milkshake, which is vanilla ice cream with chocolate syrup. I love chocolate milkshakes, but I hate chocolate milkshakes that are made with chocolate ice cream. I didn't realize that was a New York thing. But the way you say milkshake, is that a Pittsburgh thing? I think it's just a me thing. How do you say it? Say again. For for years, I've said milk, like yes. M E L K, milkshake. Right. Yes. Yeah, I think that's just a me thing. So there's a venue in Amsterdam called the Milkveg. Do you know that venue? Yes. M E L K W, pronounced as V E G. E G. Yes. Milkveg in Amsterdam. And when you say, which is like one of my favorite venues, I actually played there on my 30th birthday. Nice. And when you say milkshake, is that like something you might drink when you're at the milkshake in Amsterdam? <laughs> <laughs> this is like a very European, um, a very European episode of Jules and Jim. Yeah. <laughs> no, but when I, before I moved to New York City, I would have to say to whoever was watching over the milkshake counter, I want a chocolate milkshake, but don't make it with chocolate ice cream, make it with vanilla ice cream. Make it with, yeah, vanilla ice cream and chocolate sauce. And then there was like a long back and forth. But when I moved to New York, I could just say, make me a black and white. 
and they knew exactly what I was talking about. I didn't even know that a black and white milkshake was like a New York thing. I thought that was just a thing. Well, I, I first discovered it in New York, but when you travel outside of New York City, black and white can mean a different thing. It means that you drizzle the chocolate and you don't mix it in. And that kind of blows my mind. I'm like, what? Like, yeah, they're like, this is our black and white. Well, I'm like, mix that. Like, mix yeah. that chocolate sauce up. When I went to college in Ohio for a year, or when I went to Oberlin, uh, I remember like they called, I was so sheltered. I'd like only been to New York and I thought every city would look like New York City. It's such, it's such like a reverse way of being sheltered. And I went to Cleveland and I was like, where's the city? And they were like, this is the city. And I was like, what? Um, but they called like soda pop, you know? And all these like things that everything was called so differently. And I didn't expect that. I was so sheltered that I thought every single thing would be exactly as it was in New York. I call pop soda now and people in Pittsburgh hate me for it. Really? Because I would, whenever I would have functions in New York and I would say, hey, pass the pop, no one knew what I was talking about. So out of convenience, I'll say, hey, pass the soda. And then when I go back to Pittsburgh and I say, pass the soda, they call me a sellout. Yeah, they're like, all right. All right. Um, something I like that's black and white, but not totally black and white, but black and white in theory. So now we're talking about black and white as a construct. Yes. Is the New York Times in black and white. And when you say the New York Times in black and white, you're, when you say, I want to read the paper, like the physical paper, what do you say? I want to read it in black and white. I don't want to read it online. And that's something I enjoy is like reading the New York Times, like in black and white with like the folds and like the yes, you know, like a blanket. I miss I miss newspaper and magazines. Yes. And I still read my books on an actual book. Me too. I go to the library, I get my books and I read my books like actual books. I, I never, ever, ever read. on. I on, can't. On, yeah. It's not the Maybe same. that makes me old fashioned. Well, speaking of black and white reading material, I love black and white concert flyers. Ooh, agreed. Because anyone who started a band could make a flyer just by photocopying it. That's right. That's right. And you know, some bands later on, they would get the color copies. And you could tell who the bands were who didn't have a lot of money who still put out the black and white flyers. You're right. And I would also add on to that the black and white concert t-shirt. Because... That's right. The black and white concert t-shirt is the least expensive t-shirt to manufacture. <laughs> so you could tell when a band was like new or kind of struggling or just like not selling out and keeping it real, Fugazi. <laughs> when they had a black and white t-shirt, once you had you know, two color, four color. Then once you had like eight color, you know, now we're in a different, now we're in different emo screens. Band. Totally. Yeah. Now we're like on the warp tour, but a black and white t-shirt <laughs> is like, you know, punk. Quick question for you about Northern state. Yes. This is kind of like rewinding back to album covers. You came close. Well, I think on like one of your first EPs, it was black and white. It was. And then you put out three studio albums, right? I think you did. We did, but the first one we we kind of made on our on our own. But it was like more of a studio album. But there were two where you kind of went black and white, but you didn't totally commit. Because the first one there's yellow font. So the EP we made that got four stars in Rolling in uh, Rolling Stone by Robert Criscow was called Hip Hop You Haven't Heard. It is black and white because we did not have a dime. Okay, we borrowed five thousand dollars, like we, it was maybe thirty five hundred dollars for the whole project. We didn't have any money. We made it in black and white for sure, and it's the dopest looking one, and you can't even find it. And then dying in stereo, we had some. We made some. We sold forty thousand copies of that album out of my kitchen, and so and then we signed a deal and they repressed it, so we didn't have to pay for it. But we wanted it to look uh, like gully, and so we did it in black and white. But yes, we added the gold. That was like our the gold. Hype. Yeah, which but, disqualifies it from being a black and white album cover. That's right. And I will also say the farther into colors that we got, the worse we got like as a band. <laughs> <in a country. laughs> because until we like, you know, did something different, but it was like when we were just doing 
the pure thing that like we loved that was great without like making it complicated that's when it was good and then the more complicated it got the more colorful it got the worse it got and i think that's a metaphor for a lot of things and that's a little bit possibly the headline of the black and white episode of jules and jim should we keep all of our episodes in black and white maybe <laughs> can you can you before we close this conversation i want to open this up to lyrics because a lyric stands out to me when we're talking about black and white which is the verve who's a band that i love on their last record which i think was called fourth which wasn't like a huge hit. It had a couple, it had a couple of like, oh, like one song that did okay. But there's a song where he says, Richard Ashcroft, who's a great vocalist, says, trouble and strife, turn it into black and white. And he repeats that over. Oh, trouble and strife, turn it into black and white. Like, you know, take your problems and write them down. Yes. And I think it's really profound. And I can almost see that lyric, like interpret that as, Take your problems and then just sort of like consolidate everything, like simplify everything. Yes, I hadn't even thought of that, right? Simplify it, just see it in black and white. Black and white is just like the most baller color scheme there is. That's right. And we should also probably plug your AMP show, right? Yeah, we should. Tell every, yeah, before we go, tell everyone about your AMP show. I am on a platform called Amazon AMP. You can download it at the link in my bio and all my social media. And I'm on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays from 8.30 p.m. to 10 o'clock p.m. I do a show called Music is Therapy, where I merge my two passions, music and mental health. We talk about a topic in music, we talk about a topic in mental health and pair it with an accompanying playlist. And take callers. So for, and check that out. I've been on a couple of times. It's a, it's yeah, a good everyone show. Wants, everyone wants you back, but I don't know, like, I don't know if you have the patience for it. Well, we do this. We do this. Yeah. We'll, well, I'll come. I'll come back at some point. So, uh, for Jules, DJ, for Jules, aka DJ has to print. That's what I want to say. Uh, my name is Jim, and we will see Yins later. Yeah.